invite people to take their seats as we uh, engage in this breakout session called How Can Faith Communities Engage in Bridge Building? I'm Mark Beckwith, and I want to briefly uh, outline what Dan and I are going to do in this time that we have together. And uh, we will finish no later than 4.30, but we'll uh, uh, endeavor to finish before uh, 4.30. What we're going to do is uh, each uh, sort of in a conversational way explain who we are, what we're about, how we came to Braver Angels. Uh, we're each going to talk about our spiritual journeys uh, that defines who we are. Uh, we're going to talk about how our theologies are a bit different and in that difference, how we are committed to Braver Angels and how we each as Christians, as followers of Jesus, want to uh, offer the best of who we are and how we can best work together and uh, su offer some suggestions as to how faith communities can uh, bridge the divide. And uh, then we'll um, uh, have some time for questions and answers. Uh, but to begin, uh, I'm going to invite Dan to offer a prayer. Let's bow our heads if we can. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the, first of all, the opportunity and the privilege to gather as uh, people here from around the country, from different perspectives, different walks of life. We're thankful for the project here, uh, what we're trying to do with Braver Angels and and uh, strengthen, heal, and um, restore, in many ways, democracy and uh, promote civility, us seeing each other uh, as as human beings as, uh, before we see them as um, ideological foes or, God forbid, enemies. Uh, we pray that you would bless our conversations here and our time, uh, and we're thankful for the good news of the gospel that you have given to us through your son. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got to Braver Angels. So uh, I'm uh, right now. I'll, I'll tell you what, what I'm doing. I'm I lead uh, the Land Center for Cultural Engagement at uh, Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth. I've been there for about a year and a half. Um, uh, I have a wife and four kids. My oldest is 18, and my youngest is 11. We have three teens and a preteen. So if you could pray for us, um, it's a full house. Uh, my wife's from Fort Worth. We're back in her her hometown. I'm from Chicago originally. Um, Cubs fan. I don't know if there's any Cub fans out there. Um, well, I'll forgive you. Hey, we could be in the same room, Cubs and White Sox. There you go. Um, uh, I've done a, a number of things. Uh, my, my story goes back a little bit. Uh, m my parents uh, were first generation Christians. My father was uh, converted through the ministry of Billy Graham. Uh, Billy Graham crusade came through Chicago in 1971. And uh, he walked forward with my grandmother and uh, really changed the trajectory of his life. He was a, came from a broken home, not a lot of direction. And uh, he met my mom, who is Jewish, and she converted to Christianity as well. Uh, and they raised us in a, a Baptist church. Um, and so I'm, um, I've, I'm a Baptist pastor. I pastored in the Chicago area for a number of years and in Tennessee. I also served as a vice president of communications for Southern Baptist uh, Public Policy Arm, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. I did that for about eight years uh, before that. I've also, uh, I write, I'm an author. I've written a few books and I contribute to um, USA Today. I write for World Magazine. I've written for Washington Post and other places like that. And uh, I'm, a, I'm here at Braver Angels, really, um, because I believe in the project uh, as, a, as, a, as a follower of Christ, as a Christian. Uh, you know, I believe that we can have and should have our core convictions of what it means to be, uh, what it means for me to be a Christian. And yet also look at people who disagree with us as um, not as enemies, but as human beings, as people made in the Im image of God. My theology teaches me that uh, every human being is made in the image of God and has dignity and worth. Uh, from, from the very beginning in Genesis, when on all of creation, it says that God spoke into existence, but for humans, he crafted humans from the dust of the ground and breathed into humans the breath of life and stamped on humans his image. Um, the, in my view, the Bible's rich vision of what it means to be human is, is really Christianity's 
get, human dignity is really one of Christianity's gifts that it gives to the world. And so as a Christian, I believe, I believe so strongly in what I believe that I'm confident that it can compete in the marketplace of ideas. And so we try to persuade, but we also can see folks who disagree with us as image bearers because um, we're confident in what we believe and, and we don't have to uh, resort to violence or you know, uh, incivility in order to make the case. And so that, that's sort of why I'm here. I, I, I also, I love this country. I'm an amateur historian, if you will, which means I just, my idea of, of leisure time is reading a presidential biography or something like that. So you know, being here in Gettysburg, I mean, um, couldn't ask for a better place. And I love this country and uh, I feel it's incumbent on every generation to preserve what has been handed down to us in terms of this democracy uh, and to make it better for the people our kids that have come after us. I think we, it's a stewardship that we've been given. So that this is why I'm here. Hopefully that wasn't too long. I mean, yeah. we have two preachers up here, so it, we could go <laughs> long. <laughs> uh, I learned of Braver Angels in an article written by David Brooks in 2018. Uh, and I know many people uh, were turned on to Braver Angels from that same op-ed article. Uh, I called David Blankenhorn and uh, I went to the first uh, Braver Angels convention. Uh, I was finishing my tenure as bishop of the Diocese of Newark in the Episcopal Church. I was there for 12 years, and uh, what spoke to me was this notion of bringing difference together, and uh, that's been very, very important to me. I refer to the Episcopal Church is the secular version of the Anglican movement. Uh, our tradition was founded 500 years ago in the tension between Protestantism and Catholicism, and we have lived in that tension sometimes well, sometimes not so well, ever since. And it's been my experience when you're willing to live into the tension, some the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, a gift can emerge and a new way forward is offered. So I've been part of Braver Angels uh, uh, since 2018, it was the first convention, the second convention. Since that time, I'm on the platform committee that you'll hear more about on Saturday. I'm a part of the network committee. And uh, I'm also um, very committed and uh, involved in the faith-focused initiative, trying to engage religious communities in the Braver Angels process. Uh, and we're getting more and more congregations involved uh, in in this work because it is just so vital. And uh, the call that I feel and I'm trying to, and hearing from other people as well, we need to step outside of our buildings, engage people in our communities because the essence of who we are is repairing the world, tikkun olan from the Jewish pr perspective or reconciliation from the Christian perspective. So that's how I ended up here. And um, uh, Dan, say a little bit about your spiritual journey and, and uh, um, how that has formed you and framed you. Yeah, I mean, I shared a little bit uh, uh, before. Um, by the way, I'm also part of Brave, Brave Angels because um, uh, I believe I was on a panel at the at the. Um, we were on together. Yeah, at the St. <laughs> Louis event. I'm also really good friends with Hunter Baker, who's the chairman of the board, and uh, he he said, "Dan, you really should be a part of this," uh, and I agree with him. Um, but my spiritual journey, as I said, I grew up in a, in a Christian home. Um, I came to faith at a young age. Um, I've always felt the call. Uh, it's interesting. I've always felt kind of a dual call. One is to the ministry. I love the ministry. I love church. I love Christian ministry, um, pastoral ministry. But I've also felt uh, a call to public service, public policy. I've always been interested in politics and, and history. And I've kind of been in both worlds. Um, you know, when I'm, when I was pastoring, I would be uh, trying to help Christians think through what does it look like to live out their faith in the world. When I was working in public policy, trying to help uh, policymakers understand what the Christian community wants, what evangelicals are looking for. So I've sort of been in both worlds. Um, but I've, you know, I think some of my heroes, uh, you know, in terms of uh, spiritual heroes are people like C.S. Lewis, uh, the late Tim Keller, who just passed away, um, uh, Martin Luther King and others. And then of course, um, you know, uh, American heroes like, uh, Abraham Lincoln and, and others in terms of forming my ideas about, 
uh, democracy and about this country. So that, that's some of my uh, spiritual journey and, and the political journey, if you will. And to help frame my, uh, my context, I grew up in the Episcopal Church. I served uh, faithfully as an acolyte and was very much involved. I get to college and uh, I became um, an anti-war activist and that led me to a Quaker meeting uh, because the Quakers were so uh, committed to peace. And that's why I went, but I was introduced to silence. Uh, for anyone who's been to a Quaker meeting, their meetings are uh, entirely in silence. Uh, and so I was introduced to organized silence. Uh, part of me wondered where are the prayers, where are the hymns, where's the sermon, where are the stained glass window. But I was really, really drawn to that silence. And uh, after college, I lived in Japan for two years. Uh, where I taught English, and uh, and while there, I became uh, intrigued and enamored of Zen Buddhism, and I studied and I practiced Zen. And what was interesting about that, it's uh, organized silence uh, to the third degree. Uh, it is very organized and uh, very intense. And that journey away from what I was familiar with led me deeper into where I started. So in many ways, by going to Japan and exploring this very different faith enabled me to claim my identity as a Christian that I hadn't known before. And so I came back to this country and one of my heroes, uh, professor, mentor, and friend was Henry Nouwen. Some of you may know Henry, uh, he was a Catholic priest, wrote a lot of books. Uh, and uh, he introduced so many of us to communities of silence, and I didn't know there were such uh, communities of silence, monasteries. And uh, I'm some people accuse me of being a monastery rat because I spend a lot of time in monasteries, in silence, in prayer. And uh, mystery and silence and the liturgy are foundational pieces uh, to who I am. So I just wanted to say all that to give a, 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 a context, a, a sense of where we each started. And to ask you, Dan, as we, um, uh, again, we're both Christians, and I heard you a couple weeks ago after the Southern Baptist uh, uh, vote, and you were on NPR. Maybe other people heard uh, Dan as well. He's been is on MSNBC on Morning Joe. He's a, a public voice. And you were speaking to the Southern Baptist Convention vote. And uh, you and I have had a conversation about this. Uh, we tend to come at that issue and some other issues from a different Christian perspective. And I wonder if you could speak about that for a minute. Yeah. For, first of all, uh, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention that our, my, my faith family is, um, we're the largest Protestant denomination. We have the most democratic polity. Uh, so everybody gets a voice. And so what that means is among other things, uh, our family conversations are always public and they usually make the front page of, you know, New York times, Washington post, NPR. Um, I don't think we're wrestling with anything that any other denomination isn't wrestling with, but we're the biggest. And so we draw the most attention. Um, but a few things about Baptists that kind of form even my views on democracy, which I think are interesting. You know, Baptists um, were instrumental to the to the founding of this country, in, especially when it comes to uh, pluralism and uh, religious freedom. In fact, it was those Baptists, early Baptists like John Leland and Isaac Backus and others who were agitating uh, with the founders to um, for the the Bill of Rights. And the First Amendment, you know what they what what we've always believed. We haven't always practiced this well, but what we've always believed is that um, we want to bring our faith to the public square. So we we don't think there should be a naked public square. We we believe everyone should bring their beliefs to the public square, but we don't want government putting their foot on the scale in favor of any one religion, because you know I think the Baptists, you know, coming out of the separatist movement, uh, out of the English Reformation. And the founders, they would serve. They surveyed history and, and said, every, anytime you had um, a favored church, a state church, if you will, it, it, it's not always good for the the state, and it's not always good for the church. So Baptists have, have sort of uh, sowed the seeds for this idea of democracy that we we have. So uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, one of our distinctives, we have many distinctives. That's one of them that I talked about soul freedom and religious liberty, but we also, like a few other denominations, like the PCA and uh, 
even uh, the Catholic Church, we believe that the office of pastor, uh, particularly the, the the main preaching uh, teaching pastor, is reserved for men. Uh, not because we we believe that women are inferior, but because God has designed men, men and women with different different roles. And so, um, this summer we were just a, reaffirming what we've sort of always believed. Uh, we also passed a resolution affirming the value of women and particularly women in leadership and a variety of roles in uh, in our church and uh, in in uh, society. Um, so that was, you know, somewhat controversial and probably why I was on NPR talking about it. Um, we also, though, I will say a, th- a few other things in defense of our, and look, there's other Christian denominations that disagree on that. Uh, they see it differently. They interpret it that um, differently. A few other things that came out, we passed a resolution on immigration reform calling the uh, Congress to to try to fix this immigration uh, system in a compassionate way, but also in a in a way that honors the rule of law. And I will say this about Baptists: anywhere you see human need, you'll see uh, Southern Baptists. Uh, we have the third largest disaster relief operation in the world. So anytime there's a natural disaster, anytime there's a war, anytime there is um, any any kind of calamity like that, we have volunteers from our churches who will rush to the scene and provide shelter, uh, meals, and sometimes we'll help people out of that disaster. And so that's another of our distinctives. So that's my sales pitch for Southern Baptist. <laughs> I don't expect you're going to join though. No, I, I, well, we, we've, uh, in the Episcopal Church had a um, somewhat different evolution. Uh, women ordained uh, in the Episcopal Church in 1977. So we've been at it for a long time, uh, but it was not an easy transition. And uh, and then the whole sexuality debate um, uh, caused great consternation and uh, some division, not as much as uh, we anticipate in the Episcopal Church um, around the issue of, of sexuality. And as a bishop, uh, I've ordained women, I've ordained gay clergy, and I performed weddings for gay clergy and their spouses. And I do that because I think that sexuality is a gift. It needs to be affirmed, supported. And uh, I have a biblical uh, understanding of that. And not everybody shares that in the Episcopal Church. Uh, It's often said uh, sort of glibly, whenever there are four Episcopalians, there's always a fifth. Uh, and that says something about our, our our drinking history. But you get four Episcopalians, you get five different opinions, and uh, we we are not a a confessional church in that uh, we don't uh, subscribe to a specific theology. We're known by what we do, and what we do is really framed in our liturgy. Uh, and so we certainly have norms, we have values, and we have uh, procedures, and we argue a lot. And we're proud of a, a larger communion, uh, the second largest, or the uh, second largest um, communion in the world. There's 75, 80 million of us around the world. And when we met as bishops in 2008 in England, uh, we were addressed by Jonathan Sachs, who is the chief rabbi of England at the time. He since died, uh, amazing scholar and somebody who would be uh, full in and braver angels. And he, uh, he addressed the whole um, gathering, about 1,000, 1,200 people. And he said he went to Anglican schools. He grew up in England, so he knew all about the Anglican church. He said, you're the largest uh, volunteer organization in the world. He said, you, he didn't say, he shouted, you have to stay together for the sake of the rest of us. Because if the largest voluntary organization becomes to frac- becomes to, uh, starts to fracture, that is going to cascade out throughout the world. And we have stayed together, not easily, uh, but we have stayed together. And uh, I think that is part of our charism. As I said earlier, uh, I see Braver Angels as a secular version of the Anglican Communion. So uh, I think that in many ways uh, highlights some of our differences Uh, that we come at scripture in different ways, we come at worship in different ways, uh, but we're still fundamentally followers of Christ. And I guess the question for us in in the title of this this workshop, how can faith communities engage in bridge building? Yeah, and I I think one of the important things to think through is, um, you know, if you think about this country, uh, the, the church has been so instrumental uh, in this country. Uh, 
uh, and faith communities are in, in, instrumental in terms of democracy. And I think what that looks like, it, you know, I think a lot of people see something like this and they think that means you have to come to the table and abandon your convictions and abandon your, your beliefs and your doctrines. And I just don't think that's true. I certainly wouldn't be here if I had to do that, right? I have, you know, I'm convictionally uh, evangelical, uh, not ashamed to be evangelical, and I am uh, have Baptist convictions. Um, and yet I think um, our convictions actually bring us to the table, right? Uh, we care about our communities. Jeremiah 29, uh, Jeremiah encourages the exiles. Uh, these, these are the people of God who have been thrust into this pagan nation, and they don't know anybody. They don't know anything around them. And he says, instead of hunkering down and staying Amongst yourselves, he says, seek the welfare of your city to, to, to build and plant. Um, and I think that applies to us, that we should seek the welfare of our cities uh, from our own tradition, from our faith tradition, what that brings to bear. So um, I think we, we have an opportunity as Christians to really help heal our communities and heal our country, um, to uh, see other people who disagree with us as not as enemies, but as image bearers, as people made in the image of God. Um, so that's why I'm here. And that's why I encourage our communities to be here. I think we play a, a vital role. Uh, faith communities play a vital, vital role in this. Um, I think the loss, the loss of, um, you know, there's some people who cheer the decline of church attendance and cheer the decline of what some call a civil religion, the sort of kind of generic uh, religion that sort of bound people together. But I think when you take that away, what you have is worse. So you may not like organized religion, but you take that away. And what you have is I think worse. I think people then find people then um, find that they bond around other things. And today, a lot of what people are, are drawing people into communities is not shared loves, but shared hatreds. Um, and we're drawn to each other. People are drawn to each other by who they oppose. And so I think one of the things that, at least from my perspective, Christianity gives you, genuine Christianity gives you, is um, you're, you're drawn together by, uh, by grace. You're drawn together by, by knowing Jesus. You're drawn together by the life of Christ, by the gospel. And that should change you inwardly and then have you reach out and minister and love your neighbors, even neighbors that you strongly disagree with. A book that was... Uh very formative to me, came out about 20, 25 years ago called Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam, who lives in the same community that I do in New Hampshire when he's not teaching at Harvard. And he cites the decline of social capital, which reached its peak in the 1950s, social capital or voluntary associations, uh, church attendance, Little League uh, involvement, uh, voting, registration, neighborhood watch groups, rotary, all of those things. And uh, it's been in decline for a long, long time, such that people are now now bowling alone. Uh, so they're living atomized lives, lives. And he wrote a couple of other books, American Grace, and sort of said chillingly that each generation loses about 10% of its religious affiliation from the generation before. And that doesn't look good. His most recent book is called The Upswing. And uh, he and another researcher have, have uh, delineated several um, initiatives in American culture that are bringing uh, people together. And I remember at a lecture that he gave with his researcher, whose name I can't remember, I asked about Braver Angels and they both lit up like light bulbs. And they said, oh, Braver Angels is one of the beacons of this movement of bringing people me uh, a couple years ago to the Mandorla, and you can put that up on the screen if it comes up. There we go. The Mandorla is the Italian word for almond, and it's the shape that's created when two circles intersect. Think Venn diagram from sixth grade math. And the Mandorla is depicted a lot in Christian art, uh, not a halo, but a, a, a a frame within which, um, actually, the icon that I pray in front of most every day is the Anastasis icon. Jesus is risen from the dead, and he's pulling Adam and Eve out of hell, and he's framed in the mandorla. 
And the mandorla is the place of transformation. It's the place of surrender. It's a place that we don't easily enter into. It's a place that the polarity, polarities on either side of the continuum don't want us to enter. They want us to spend our time on one side of the circle or another. And I think Braver Angels is an initiative, is a movement to invite people into the mandorla space. And I think it's, it's vital to do that. I also think that the prophetic voice today, usually we think of prophets as talking against something. Uh, so many prophets are calling people to stay within one side of the circle. So they're speaking to an echo chamber. I think the true prophets are the ones who are calling us into the mandorla, into the place of common ground. Not necessarily compromise, although compromise can come out of it, but common ground. Where are our common roots? How, what language can we use together? How can we be followers of Jesus and have different theologies but still claim that fundamental passion? So I, I just leave you with that image, and he can take it off because we're streaming, and they need to see our lovely faces. So um, that, that, that's really good. One of the things I think about um, is, you know, I fundamentally believe that humans are made uh, to worship. Humans are worshiping beings. Uh, C.S. Lewis talks about this quite a bit, and, and Tim Keller talked about it quite a bit. Um, uh, and in fact, um, there's that famous uh, graduation speech. Hunter Thompson said, you know, every, everyone worships. Um, and so I think what you're seeing in, in America in many places is with the decline of religion, uh, people are filling that hole with religious activity, but many times they're filling it with politics. And politics, look, politics is important, right? So I'm not against politics. Politics is the... The activity of the polis of the city, you know, how do how do we? It's it's people trying to make this world better and organize it. But politics, uh, as an all-consuming, totalitizing thing, uh, as a religion, is really unhealthy. When people are putting their whole hope in the next election or the next, you know, midterm or whatever. And look, I think elections are important. I have certain people I want to win. I'm conservative. I'm. Uh, but when that becomes a totalitizing thing, then you start to s divide people into friends and enemies in ways that really are unhealthy, right? That even people you might even agree with. You know, one of the sad things for me that I have seen uh, in the last four to five years, and I don't know if you've seen this too. I was just talking with someone before I came up here, is how this era has really um, changed people. I have, I have really close, I have friends who have been so changed by this era, they've even gone very far right or very far left in ways that are just like unrecognizable. Um, and to let a figure, to let a moment change you in such a way, um, I think there's a religious aspect to that, that people people are filling their, what used to be a religious, uh, they're filling that void with with politics. And politics out of, out of place is really unhealthy. It leads to, you know, what we're seeing here on this uh in Gettysburg, this battlefield here in Gettysburg. So I think religion, and I would say specifically, genuine uh, lived out Christianity um, applied to politics in a healthy way puts politics in its place. I think we do politics better when it's not our ultimate thing. I think we practice politics better when it's our life doesn't depend on it. When we have meaning and satisfaction in other areas and we have enough self-confidence then we can enter that political arena knowing that we're going to do the best we can we're going to make our case run for office or whatever that is or vote for people but then if we win great then we'll be able to steward that power for the good of others if we lose okay we still believe in what we believe and we um come back another time for it and so i i think that's a really important thing um a lot of folks a lot of seculars decline or uh, cheered the decline of religion as a good thing. And now I think we're saying, ah, be careful what you wish for, because what fills that void is often really unhealthy. 
uh, we've talked about this. Each of us have had the experience from another Christian, and my guess this may have happened to some of you who are here who identify as Christians. I have been told that I'm not a Christian, uh, which is a, a tremendously hurtful thing. And you've, you've had that said to you as well. You indicated to me. And uh, Christianity uh, involves a broad spectrum. And uh, we were talking about this, that we, by hearing difference, we learn more about our faith. Uh, I, I just think that that's, uh, that's just so, so important. And if we build ourselves into silos, uh, that, makes us, um, that makes it that much different, dip more difficult. Uh, the root of the word religion is a Latin word, religio, which refers to the practices, habits, narratives, and symbols that we use to bind people together. So fundamentally, religion is that which binds people together. We all have stories of religion dividing us apart, but fundamentally religion is that which binds us together. Uh, and one way to do that, and uh, in my tradition, and I'm just wondering how many change the peace. Many here exchanged the peace. Uh, the peace was reintroduced in my tradition in the early 1970s. And the congregation that I attended was not happy to engage in it. Um, some people sat down. Some people walked out. People said, I'm here to worship God, not to pay attention to the person to the right or the left of me. I remember my father said to me, he thought the peace was some device hooked up by headquarters to thaw out what was then known as the frozen chosen Episcopalians. And I was a religion major in college at the time. I said, no, it goes back to the fifth chapter of Matthew's gospel. Uh, when Jesus says, if you're bringing a gift to the altar and remember that you have uh, something against your brother or sister, put your gift down and be reconciled to your brother or sister. Uh, in our tradition, it's become a celebration of community. So Episcopalians have been thought out a bit over the past 40 years. But fundamentally, it's an act of reconciliation. To my mind, it's one of the most important things that we can do, that whatever separates us, and oh, sweet Jesus, is there a lot that separates us, whatever separates us can be brought together through the reconciling love of God. And so the person we exchange the peace with symbolically represents someone with whom we need to be at peace. And if the person standing next to us is the person we live with, often that's the person we most need to make peace with. So I think it's something that we, we need to do within our communities, but also beyond our walls to go into the community and, and, in, and be agents of reconciliation. And the final thing I want to say about worship, uh, Dan, you were mentioning that. One of my favorite theologians is Walter Brueggemann, uh, an uh, Old Testament scholar who uh, says, originally, worship is the public processing of pain. Is the public processing of pain. And when you gather people together, they can express their pain. And there's a lot of pain now. And in our tradition, uh, we're so, some would say, so regimented that the pain doesn't really get to emerge or it comes out sideways. Uh, worship needs to offer up pain. And certainly the Eucharist, for my tradition, is uh, the ultimate pain. And then out of that comes life and hope. And uh, I think we need to, as, as Christians, to, to celebrate that, to um, proclaim that, and to engage with others in that. That's really good. I think we should also think through one of the important things about a gathering like this and a movement like this is to think importantly, what are the things we can do together and what are the things we can't do together? And I think it's, it's good to have both, right? Um, there, there are going to be... You, I think of it in a series of concentric circles, right? And in the center of that circle, and as a faith community, there are some, there are going to be some um, hardcore beliefs that you're, that we feel as evangelicals that we're not going to budge from, right? We we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. We believe that, you know, in the exclusivity of Christ as a way of salvation. We believe that in the, you know, virgin birth, the bodily resurrection of Christ. There's a number of things that 
that are core beliefs to us that we are not going to surrender on. Um, and we're always going to believe those, but then you start to widen the circle. And so, so when it comes to like how we gather and organize and worship, you know, we're going to be far apart. And I think it's always going to be like that. Um, but when it comes to things we can do in our communities and in our city, uh, we're talking something different. You know, there, there are things we can do together to meet human needs, to uh, strengthen our democracy, to make sure that this is a good place uh, for our, our kids and grandchildren to live in. Uh, and I don't think we have to surrender those core things in order to do these other things. In fact, those core things animate us to do works uh, in, in, in the community and serve our neighbors. And so I think it's important to understand what we're talking about, right? And uh, one of the beauties, one of the things I love about Braver Angels is they don't ask you to sort of check that, those core beliefs at the door. But we're interacting with people who are different than us and we're learning from them and growing and saying, how can we uh, live together side by side? I think of it in our communities, our cities, our states, our countries. You know, we're all in this, think of it like a boat, right? We're all in the same boat. We have different beliefs. We don't want that boat to take on water. We don't want that boat to sink or to, or to, or to um, you know, to uh, capsize. We want to, so we all have a vested interest in these communities to make them work. And I think we all bring something to the table a little bit differently. Evangelicals bring something to the table that your community doesn't bring and vice versa. And so I think that's how we should think about it. That yeah, makes sense. and the passion and the commitment I think is really important. That's what I've drawn from uh, from you and others that I've I've gotten to know in the evangelical community. Dan, as we were talking uh, before this session, you were saying that by talking to someone else with a different perspective on Christianity, it it, it helped clarify your own. I, I want to want to put words in your mouth, but that's how I heard it. You want to say more about that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think um, learning from other traditions can be helpful. Right. So I think of the, as a, as a Baptist, you know, we're, we're heirs of the reformation. We're grateful the reformation happened. Um, but man, we draw so much from our Catholic, uh, brothers and sisters because their Catholic social teaching, you know, has really guided uh, a lot of what we do in the world. Uh, we think of the liturgical pra practices of other faith traditions of other Christian traditions that have helped inform us. Um, I mean, I can go through the traditions. I can, and, and you know, I think Baptists bring uh, a lot to the table in terms of religious liberty, evangelism, um, sort of, um, you know, Baptists and Methodists. I think were the were the the people that, especially in this country, were for the common folks. You, you know, there wasn't a lot of barriers to to starting a church, especially especially as Baptists and Methodists went out into the frontier and started starting churches and all that. Um, so I'll always be a Baptist, but I learn a lot, say, from our Methodist fr friends and the, the Wesleyan Methodist tradition of uh, social action and prayer and holiness. I learn a lot from the Anglican tradition in terms of liturgy and, and, and um, all that, and from the Lutheran tradition. And there how impoverished we would be without the black church who has taught us so much about perseverance under under uh, persecution, under duress. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had a chance to go with some Christian leaders to the African American uh, Museum in um, DC. And uh, everyone should go visit that if you have an opportunity. It's just, it's, it's something you, you really need to do. But one of the things that struck me was how the African American community kept the faith through this entire 400 years of, of uh, oppression and kept the faith. Um, and really, in many ways, it was the faith that kept, got them through uh, all of this. And so I, I just think we learn from other, other traditions, even, even as we, are, we stay rooted in our own. Yeah. I, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking again about Walter Brueggemann, who made the, makes the distinction between the presumed world and the proposed world. I grew up in the presumed world. Um, uh, I'm white. I grew up in a fairly well-to-do family, had good education. And the presumed world is if you keep your nose clean, get good grades, uh, know the right people, uh, things are going to work out. Uh, and uh, and uh, um, there are lots of communities that 
don't subscribe to the presumed world. Um, uh, my experience in the black church, having preached there a bunch of times, been invited a bunch of times, uh, they're operating in the proposed world uh, because the presumed world has been denied. And so the proposed world is all focused on this faith, on this hope, on this passion uh, that Martin Luther King so galvanized the country around. Uh, proposing a world that we can live in. And what's hard, if you live in the presumed world, uh, there's a part of me that doesn't want to give it up uh, because uh, life has worked out well for me. I remember reading Ta-Nehisi's uh, Coates book. I remember talking to a, uh, a friend of mine who was a homeless guy who's in Newark and uh, African-American guy. And uh, we, we shared with each other what we were reading. And he said to me, um, he told me he was reading James Joyce, and I looked at him with a quizzical eye, and I said, really? Um, I, I can't get through James Joyce. I mean, it's just too complicated. Oh, he loves James Joyce. And he said, what are you reading? And I said, well, I'm reading this book called Ta by Ta-Nehisi Coates called Between the World and Me. And uh, he says, uh, and his premise is, the American dream is built uh, uh, for people like me on the backs of people like him. And he looks at me and he goes, you didn't know that. <laughs> and, uh, and I did, but I certainly didn't know it to the extent that he knew that. And so that enabled us to, um, uh, you know, deepen our relationship, to tell our stories. I think it's just so important to be able to tell our stories, as you said, Dan, not to check our convictions at the door, but to tell our full stories and to hear one another and really to listen and to honor the tradition from which we come. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, and I've had similar humbling experiences myself. One of the things I also want to say about, and I, I'm speaking from evangelical Christianity because it's what I know, but one of the things I think about it um, when it comes to democracy, when it comes to activism, you know, everybody and, and politics, people, people get in, involved in politics because there's this, there's this instinctive sense that the world is not as it should be, right? At the basic level, whether you're Republican or Democrat, whether you're uh, a capitalist or a socialist or, or whatever you are, if you're active in politics, if you're active in trying to, to make change, it's because you, you, you instinctively understand that the world is not as it should be, that, it sh that there's a way the world should be and, it, and it's not as it should be. And I would argue that that sensibility is borrowed from Christian theology that describes in the very beginning that the world is one's good, that has been corrupted by sin, uh, that God in Christ is renewing and restoring the world, uh, and he's renewing and restoring human hearts, that, that Christ in his death and resurrection not only brings personal re redemption and a reconciliation in our relationship with God, but it also, in, def in, in rising again, he defeated sin and death, and that uh, reversed the curse. That means that he's renewing and restoring the world, the planet the universe. And so rightly ordered and rightly understood faith. And I would, I would say for me, my Christian faith, my uh, evangelical Christian faith has helped me get involved in this in a way that is healthy because, you know, activism can really burn people out. Um, if you feel like you have to bear the whole weight of the world on your shoulders and it can be a sort of treadmill where you're working hard, but you're never seeing progress and you, you don't feel like anything's being done, right? But Christianity with its sort of vision for the world, and I would say it's, it's es eschatological vision, we understand that we do as much as we can in our communities where we can with our limited resources and we trust God is, is doing the rest. He's remaking the world. So it tempers our politics in a way that's healthy. Right. If we think we have to usher in the kingdom of God ourselves, this is where you get an unhealthy politics and sometimes even an unhealthy mixing of religion and politics. When we think it's up to us to make the world right, instead of understanding that we have been given a stewardship of one life and uh, limited resources and limited influence. And we do what we can in the moment, trusting that God is taking our story and is part of his larger story to remake the world. I think it, I think faith tempers politics. I think a politics and a democracy without faith communities, without virtue, without character, 
is really impoverished. I mean, the founders understood this, right? Um, uh, John Adams said, you know, this, this democracy, this thing will only work for a moral and a virtuous people. Uh, and so I think we have an opportunity as faith communities to set the temperature in the, in the culture to help, uh, trans, to help bring the witness as a, as a Christian, as an evangelical Christian, to bear witness to Christ so that he can transform hearts so that then people can go and live renewed lives. I think that, that part of democracy is so important. Uh, the, the faith foundation, the, the civic virtue that uh, our faith communities bring. Without it, I think people are going to be spinning their wheels. I think people are going to be frustrated and uh, it's not going to be as healthy. Thank you. Uh, the one way I want to get to some questions and Michelle, you have the microphone and uh, I'll invite the first person then Dan can uh, right there, right near Michelle. And if you say uh, who you are and where you're from and then ask a question and if you could stand. Am I next? Yes. By the way, we're going to, I'm going to punt all hard questions to him. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm only going to take the easy ones. Uh, Larry Mead from, from New York. Um, I'm delighted to see a session about religion. Uh, so I work in my academic life primarily as a scholar of poverty, welfare, and public policy questions. And I find it very difficult to get uh, experts or even theologians to address the important theological issues raised by these subjects. Uh, and certainly essential to any of the work of Braver Angels. So I'm fundamentally very positive at everything you're saying. But at the same time, I have to say that in the world that I occupy theologically, I am an Episcopalian from Manhattan, and I find that my local church is very supportive. I have nothing but praise for my local clergy and my fellow members of the congregation, and so on and so on. I feel very much welcome. But at a higher level, this church, like every other church I've ever known, is at war with white men. It's political dictums about what we should do to solve our problems Americally, in America is primarily to load further obligations on white men, on people like me. And especially all the current liberal issues are, the church is far to the left on all the prominent issues currently. Not the whole church, but the upper, upper levels of the church. Uh, the institutions, in other words, they are certainly not supportive of the dialogue that Braver Angels is supposed to be engaged in. Okay, thank you. That's, uh, um, uh, appreciate your, your, your passion and concern and, and, uh, and position on all that. It needs to be heard. Or you want us to respond to that? Um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think through that. I mean, you and I have talked offline. I do think sometimes, you know, your experience of feeling like you're not being heard in that context that, uh, I think it's valid. I think that happens in a lot of places where, you know, uh, on either side, you can sort of shut out voices that are important to hear. Um, and it can sometimes, sometimes can be elitist, you know, where we don't want to hear the perspective of someone. Uh, I, I, I am nervous about a culture that always is always finding scapegoats. Right. So if, 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 if the, all the problems in the world today are blamed on, you know, white men, whatever, I don't think that's health, a healthy way to do it. Or if you want to find some other interest group or some other, uh, scapegoat to, to blame it on, I don't, I don't think that that's healthy, you know? So I, I share your concern in, in many ways. Well, and uh, uh, speaking of the notion of, uh, of scapegoat, um, on Yom Kippur, in the ancient Jewish tradition, uh, a goat was presented to the uh, high priest in the Holy of Holies, and the goat had all sorts of uh, scurrilous things written on it, and then the goat was thrown out into uh, outside the city where it would be devoured by beasts. Uh, the original scapegoat, that's where it comes from. And uh, the Jewish tradition has is, is moved beyond that, but we have not. Uh, we have not. Uh, and um, Rene Girard, a, um, a psychologist, theologian symbol uh, person, um, said that uh, scapegoats always work for a while. Uh, if you f identify a scapegoat, 
white men, black men, uh, white women, uh, gay and lesbian people, immigrants. It always works for a while. And then you need to come up with another scapegoat or increase your venom against a scapegoat. And I believe my faith says that Jesus said, no more scapegoats. We're not going to do that anymore. Uh, but we still do it. And uh, it's a very tempting thing to do. And it's awful to feel that way. Uh, but I think uh, we need to rise up above that. Yeah, it's, it's a convenient way also to avoid nuance, right? To just find a, find a convenient foil that is the problem with all the problems in society. And um, I think your raising of Gerard is exactly right. I actually think the social media culture has turned us more into a shame-honor culture than we used mm -hmm. to be. Uh, Andy Crouch, I don't know if any of you have read Andy Crouch's work. Uh, he's written a number of things on this. He wrote a a long piece in Christianity Today about this, of how we've shifted to an honor-shame society because of social media. I mean, every, every day, Twitter or whatever the dominant social media platform is, is looking for a fresh scapegoat, a fresh person to be mad at, a fresh person to blame. And it, I think this phenomenon crosses tribes, left, right, center. Um, so I think you, you tapped into something interesting. Oh yeah, well, another question? Let's see. Man, so many hands. Uh, let's see. Let's start, let's start right here with the, with the hat on, sir. What's your name? Hats always get the question. That's right. Um, the title of this session is how, being the operative word, how can the faith communities engage in bridge building? Gentlemen, I'm sorry, but all I have heard basically, is if each a lot of your personal or your faith theology. I've heard a lot of it. I did not hear an answer to how. That's a great question. Great question. I think you have to, under, you have to see where in your faith community you can partner and where you can't, right? And I'm, I mean, I know as evangelicals, there's, there's certain projects that are central to our theology that we're not going to partner with folks who radically disagree with us on certain things. But then if you widen that circle, and I think there's a lot of areas, particularly as we think about what we can do in our cities and our communities to make them better, there's a lot of areas we can partner with, right? When you think, start to think about civic projects, when you think about humanitarian projects, and, and um, that's good to do in our communities because our community needs it, right? So whether it's a local public school needs um, uh, tutors to help kids read, right? Because if, Reading is so essential uh, to rising in, in this country. Or if it's food insecurity, if it's a disaster, or if you know if there's a problem afflicting the community, whether it's um, you know the op opioid epidemic or or addiction, what are areas where radically different communities that are not going to worship together and not going to agree can nevertheless partner for the good of the city? And I think that act is good for its own good because we need to help our community, the need is there, but also the exercise of doing it is good. Uh, to see people that we normally don't gather with and normally don't see as uh, fellow image bearers and, and fellow human beings. Uh, to respond to your question, before uh, the 2020 election, several months before, Bill Doherty called me up and said, you know, we're going to have a train wreck with this election. Uh, how, do we, how do we prepare for it with Braver Angels? And we put together with Malice Towards None, referring to um, Lincoln's second inaugural address, and we put together all these resources for colleges, um, civic groups, and religious communities. And we had 400 uh, who were, and we got them involved in conversations. Many of them carried out the, uh, the uh, programs that we put together after the election. We continue to do that work. Now we have faith-focused workshops. Many of you have, been do have done depolarizing within. Faith-focused -fo workshops offers a wrapper, uh, W-R-A-P-P-E-R, -P -P -E uh, for Christian groups and uh, Jewish groups. They've both been piloted, and we hope to get uh, Muslim groups as well. So it'll begin with a prayer, some scripture offerings, end with a prayer. I've been working with some Episcopal congregations, one in uh, New Hampshire, one in Michigan, one in Minnesota, and hope to get one in, in Atlanta uh, uh, 
who are, have been doing that within their congregations, dealing with this uh, tension within the congregation, and some of them are considering, and one has, offered Braver Angels workshops to uh, the rest of the community based in the congregation, and some are feeling saturated by that. How do we take it beyond that? And we're still thinking that through. So the how is not fully formed yet, uh, how best to do that. Uh, uh, I think one of the reasons that we talked about our, our theologies and our spiritual experiences to give a sense of where we are coming from and from that place is where we need to go. Uh, because if we just start doing reconciliation without really grounding ourselves in the traditions from which we come, uh, that's, uh, that uh, minimizes the effect of what we can do. Uh, I've been ordained 43 years. In those 43 years, I've had lots of conversations and relationships uh, with Jewish leaders and Muslim leaders. Actually, a rabbi, imam, and I were on TV a bunch, and we took a group of people to... Um, uh, to Israel-Palestine together. But in my 43 years, rarely, rarely have I been in conversation at the level that I have been with Dan. And I think those of us in the mainline side and those of us in the evangelical side need to do better to build relationships across that difference. Because in my experience, that's a bigger chasm than between Christians and Jews and Christians and Muslims. And we need to do something about that. And, and that's not easy. Uh, next person uh, in the front row, the second tier front row. There we are. Name and uh, where you're from. Hi, I'm Kelly Murphy Mason. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm an ordained minister and a Christian and a feminist. And I find it supremely regrettable that we're not seeing women religious leaders on the platform with you all, especially given the Southern Baptist Convention decision. Um, there was an editorial that came out by Serene Jones, who's president of the Union, the Union Theological Seminary, about, um, we're not going to use the word hypocrisy, but the inconsistency of the Southern Baptist decision. And it has to do with the subjugation of women. And I'm, I'm conscious in a lot of these conversations, we can talk about the sin of racism in the church. But for some reason, we can't yet talk fluently and openly about the sexism of the church. And a lot of the work that I do as a religious professional is helping women and queer folks recover from the patriarchal oppressions and injuries and wounds inflicted upon the church. And so this is a time to have a call to atonement, right? I mean, I think the church is atoning in all sorts of ways. But I do think that there's something... There's a certain triumphalist message and, frankly, a Christo-fascist message if the images that were given of people, that all the people get of, of God is, is Heavenly Father, right? Like, can we recognize the idolatry in our own religious practices and open them up so that they're welcoming and affirming of any number of identities of people? So I guess my concern is, you know, when you get to these points that are sort of non-negotiable, right, like we recognize these people as participants, or we recognize these people as pastors, or we recognize these people as preachers, people like me are no longer a part of the conversation. So I'm not sure what conversation you all are inviting me into, and I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that now. Uh, appreciate your question. Um, I mean, there's, there's a number of ways to, to answer that. I think, you know, I think the way that you see us as Southern Baptists is, is maybe not the way that we see ourselves, right? And so we come at this from, you know, convictions from Scripture, from, from a place of, of, of um, you know, authenticity and honesty about what we believe about it. And so our view of ordination of women is not that we... Th it's just we, we believe God has given different roles and different um, things to men and women. And we we try. We don't always do it well. We try to elevate women in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, Southern Baptist Convention has a lot of female leaders, a lot of women uh, leadership. But this is this is distinctive that we've had for most of our history. Um, other Christians disagree with that. And there's um, denominations where, where uh, those are. You know, they have a different view of that. But I do think it begins with not seeing each other in the worst possible terms, right? So conservatives looking at liberals and, and only seeing 
the most extreme part of that faction and thinking everybody is this way. Or liberals seeing evangelicals and only seeing them in the worst possible way, right? So when I see a, a liberal who disagrees with me, if I think every liberal is, you know, some sort of Marxist or whatever and lump everyone into that group, I don't think that's really fair. And liberals looking at conservatives like me and only seeing whatever fascist or whatever pejorative there is, I think that's sort of against the spirit of what we're trying to do here to say, hey, let me understand why you come to this position. I may not agree with you. I may not agree with why you're here. But let me, let me try to understand why you get to this position. You know, if I assume that you got to this position because of, because of malice, because of these motives, then, you know, that's not going to help us bridge those divides. But if I understand, you know, there's a very real genuine reason why someone believes this, what we believe, and there's, there's a lot more opportunity for understanding. I uh, listened to you and uh, you were asked this question, or not exactly the same way, but when you were on NPR and I thought uh, you spoke uh, very eloquently and clearly about the Southern Baptist tradition. And I was quite upset uh, by the decision that the Southern Baptists made. And I thought, well, I'm not a Southern Baptist. Um, I'm not, and, 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 but, but I'm not a Southern Baptist. And, um, but, but I'm in fellowship with Southern Baptists and need to be in fellowship with Southern Baptists. And uh, I remember speaking at a, at a Lutheran convention and somebody asked me the question, um, uh, I was talking about braver angels and was um, challenging me on that. And I've heard this from a lot of different people. Oh, if, if I or you start developing relationships with the other side, aren't you betraying your values? And that's a very, very important question. And my response was and is, as I develop relationships with people who think profoundly differently from me, it deepens my own conviction. I'll give an example. I spend a lot of time on gun violence prevention. I was one of the founders of Bishops United Against Gun Violence. Been at it for 10 years. And uh, I'm more and more inclined to believe that if we're going to move the needle on gun violence prevention, much of it has to come from the gun rights people. Uh, from the gun rights people and the people who live on my side cast aspersions, doubts, self-righteousness or smug against the other side. And that just causes the other side to double down. And, and, and so how do we do it? And it's a strategy issue. And people are upset. I get upset around the gun violence issue. There are days I say, I'm quitting. This is too big a rock up too steep a hill. hill. I'm going to enjoy my retirement. <laughs> uh, but need to keep at it, and there's not one right way to do it. Uh, so I think, um, and, and around the whole issue of conciliation, uh, in an earlier question uh, about white men, I was talking about my commitment to Braver Angels with a very close friend of mine, a lesbian woman priest. And I said, I do all this work in conciliation. She said, you know, Mark, <laughs> uh, most conciliation conversations are framed by white men in power. Oh, I said, that was a very interesting uh, way of looking at it, uh, which I hadn't heard of, thought of before. And that helped me understand uh, a different way of coming at this issue. Uh, my next, uh, right here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, my name is Jennifer, and Jennifer Maxwell, and I'm from New Hampshire. Um, from where, New Hampshire? New Ham um, Southern New Hampshire. Where? Um, Milford. Okay, I'm in Jaffrey, so okay. Wonderful. Where we can have coffee sometime. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I fall prey to being a little long-winded sometimes, so I wrote my question down. Um, so I wanted to highlight in the church, especially in the evangelical tradition, this um, go out and spread the gospel, make disciples, spread the message of Jesus Christ. And um, in my experience, although limited in some extent, um, the church as a whole has been um, quiet in my generation for spreading the gospel and spreading what 
what uh, what is the benefits of following and submitting to Jesus. Um, and so I wanted to know in your both experience um, with encouraging and training and equipping people to share the gospel and disciple and share boldly in the world um, about their religious faith, how can those types of trainings be um, empowering for those who want to practice sharing their voice on values of politi politics and bridging the divide in a way of that boldness and speaking forward and introducing a conversation that so many people are afraid to start in any everyday situation? That's a great question. That is a great question. And look, you asked a, a Baptist about evangelism, so here we go. Um, so one of the interesting thing that's a, that's a, almost a... Um, counterintuitive that you may not think about is um, the most evangelistic communities among evangelicals. First of all, evangelicals do need to, we do need to prioritize evangelism more and I'll get to that in a second. But what's interesting, even if you're, you know, if you're not an evangelical, if you're not a Christian and you think, oh, you know, evangelism, they're trying to persuade people to become believers. Uh, I don't like that you'll find that uh, the most evangelistic churches among evangelicals are the ones that are the most um, um, kind and benevolent toward whether it's immigrants or refugees or people in their communities because they really want to you know, invite people into uh, what has changed them. When we think about evangelism, I know it's a scary word for people who are not Baptists or not evangelicals. It's really an invitation. It's really saying, this is something I have experienced in my own life. I've experienced this life-changing, this transforma transformative experience in my life. And I would love for you to have that too. And in a sense, all of us are evangelists for the things that we like, right? Um, if you had a good experience on a trip, if you just got a new car and you want to tell everyone about it, if you got, if you had some, if you went to a great restaurant with your spouse and it was so good. You're just telling everyone, I can't believe how good this was. You're, you're evangelizing for that thing. And so evangelism for us is inviting people to what we believe is life transformative in a relationship with, with, with Christ. Um, so I don't think it's at odds with, with what we're doing in terms of politics. Um, I think evangelism actually tempers our politics and helps us put politics in the right perspective, right? Because if ultimately we want to invite people into this transformative experience with Jesus, it'll make our politics uh, much more friendly, much more kind, because we're, we're trying to invite people into it. So that's a great question. I do think there is a sort of decline in evangelism in this age, uh, and I think that has contributed to some of the unhealth in, in many parts of our church, if that makes sense. I appreciate the question. I grew up in the mainline church, the Episcopal church, uh, and when I was growing up, uh, if the church door was red, the music was on key, and the, music, uh, the sermons 15 minutes or less, people automatically came. Uh, and those days have been gone for 40 years. And a colleague of mine said, evangelism in the Episcopal Church is bringing an aquarium down, down, down to the beach and waiting for the fish to jump in. Uh, so one thing that we need to learn from evangelicals is to tell the story. Uh, we're not good at telling the story. That said... Um, I am not going to evangelize a Muslim to become a Christian. Uh, my evangelical impulse with a Muslim is to help that Muslim become a better Muslim and for me to be, learn how to be a better Christian or for a Jew to be a better Jew. Uh, there are some Christians who say, oh, no, no, we all got to be, be uh, under the umbrella of Christ. I, I don't subscribe to that. A lot of Christians do. That's a, I may be a fault line between us, but we in the mainline tradition, certainly in the Episcopal Church, we need to learn how to tell our story. And as, as Dan said, you know, this is where my life is fed. This is where I feel life. This is, uh, this is important, and I want to share it with you. And I invite you to join with me or uh, for you to claim the roots of who you are, where God is leading you to be. I'm going to disagree. I, I, I do want all of you to become followers of Jesus, and uh, I'm unashamed about that. Uh, but it's an invitation. It's, we don't co our evangelism isn't coercive. Uh, it's an invitation. But um, so, okay, so man, so many questions. Um, 
gentleman in the white shirt back there, you've been patiently holding up your hand and I don't want to miss, miss you. Thank you so much. Really been uh, enjoying the conversation. I think quotes are really powerful in instructing how we go about life. And w wanted to share one, um, and it's from Reverend Barber that I think is really powerful. And it goes to so many hot button issues that take up so much of the oxygen when there's so much that we need to do that gets ignored. And what he says is um, we need to talk more about what, Sorry, so his exact words, um, as close as I can get to them, is um, we talk so much about what Jesus says so little and so little about what Jesus says so much. So I would love to hear a little bit more about how theologically you see um, <clears throat> faith traditions addressing structural issues in our society um, because, you know, um, we hear and see a lot of soup kitchens, but um, there's a lot that that society um, is 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 needing from us as as, as people of faith. Um, and should have said this should have said this at the top, but Jose, Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, um, Jesus said so much about little and so little about so much. Is that, I want to make sure I understood you. Talking about I, structural issues. You know. Uh, so Reverend Barber says that in society, well, specifically American society, there's so many people that um, say so much about what Jesus says so little and so little about what Jesus says so uh, much, like poverty, um, loving thy neighbor, love thy neighbor, no exceptions, um, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would say and, um, th that he offered full blessing on everyone, not just some, but everyone. And he made a real choice, uh, real choice to go to the least lost and, and uh, the forgotten and, and said they're all a part of, uh, of the human family. They need to be part of, of the community and we're not whole unless they're here as well. So uh, that certainly impels me um, and I think uh, is, is a message that we can all sort of uh, uh, subscribe to, I think. Yeah, and I think you mentioned structural issues. I think you know, Christianity has a theology that says sin is both, uh, you know, the sin that has broken the world is both personal, that we're all, uh, we're all sinners in need of uh, a savior, but then also sin can be uh, structural and cosmic, right? That uh, it can infect our systems and the, the people that are in charge of our systems are sinners. Doesn't, you know, I, it doesn't mean every, every, every structure in uh, society is sinful, but there are ways in which they can work against human flourishing. Um, I, I think one of the ways that braver angels can be helpful and one of the ways we can be helpful as faith communities is, is to recognize that um, particularly in issues of poverty, healthcare, all those issues, that very good people agree on the problem. They agree that this problem is there, but they might come at the solutions from different perspectives, Right. So some might believe the solution to poverty is is uh, more more government involvement. Government. Some might believe that the solution is more private or faith based. Or a lot of people are somewhere in the middle. They think you need a kind of a mix of all these things. And so I think one of the ways that we can build bridges to, is to understand if I dis you know if, if as a conservative I disagree with a liberal in terms of his approach to poverty. I shouldn't assume that he has bad motives, that he, he genuinely cares about this problem and he or she thinks this is the best way to solve it and, and vice versa. That a conservative who believes more in the free market or believes more in uh, you know, private solutions or faith-based solutions, he, he genuinely cares about the issue, but he or she thinks this is the best solution, right? And I think when we come together, we could say, okay, let's put our heads together and figure out what is the best way to help communities in need? Um, instead of fighting about or, or sort of, you know, fighting against caricatures of the other, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I uh, um, the notion of mission, as I have learned it, uh, that we've had for a long, long time in the wealthy West, is mission is bringing God to places where God is not. Uh, think of the arrogance of that for a moment. 
Uh, I would subscribe that there's not a square inch of the, uh, on, the, on the face of the earth where God is not working. And mission is joining God in that work. And so often mission then becomes doing work for others. So it reinforces the gap between those who have and those who don't. And what is so powerful about Braver Angels and what I think churches need to do, religious communities need to do, is to get out of the anxiety. <laughs> it's easier for me now that I'm retired. Get out of the anxiety of, of the preservation of the institution. Because so much of the en uh, energy goes on, on on dollars and people, you know, how are we going to sustain uh, our our communities? And instead, not instead, and in addition to, be out in our communities and join God in God's work and build relationships, particularly with relationships or with people who come at life in a different way, either from a different theology or different life experience, different race, different religion. Uh, that's something I think that we need to do. And I, I, uh, I, I, um, I get real weary of uh, congregations and leaders in congregations who spend so much of their time, and there's a lot, of, lot to worry about. I call them the killer bees, buildings, budgets, boilers, and burnout. And then when I was a bishop, somebody added bishops is the killer bee. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that, it, that can take up an enormous amount of time, and they're important issues but they can be just come distractions from the real work of what we need to be doing and reconciling in the community. Who's next? I don't know. How much time do we have? Oh, we have 15 minutes. Yes, Greg, hey, first you? president of Braver Angels. I wasn't the president. I was the first co-chair of the Red. Oh, first okay. So what you just said is kind of what I've been sitting here running through my mind. Love can be used as a noun. Love can be used as a verb. And I think this is the epitome of love right here. Everybody's, they're just not talking about it. They're, we're doing it. The Braver Angels has been doing it since the first time I ever stepped in amongst the Braver Angels. So with that in mind, there's a parallel running here of our faith communities. There's parallel of everything, but especially in this group, there's a parallel of what the faith people, people of faith are wanting to do and what Braver Angels want to do. The first thing we have to do in our faith community is what Braver Angels has already shown that they're able to do, and that is put on your blinders as far as color, uh, um, sex, all that stuff. These lanyards, I think it'd be cool if they were clear because then we're all just one. We're all the same. We're doing the same thing. So if we Braver Angels can blend with the faith community and go out and make love a verb and do something, okay, the first thing we have to do to be able to do that is learn about forgiveness. Forget about what's happened in the past. We, we have to forgive as Christians. We have to forgive as anybody that, that believes in God. You have to forgive because he's a forgiving God. He's a loving God, okay? So why can't we, or I'm not saying why can't we, but the, the answer is this. Our faith community and our braver angels community has to come together. We go from here, we go back to our churches that we're going to, presumably we're all going to church, okay, and we're fellowshipping. We go back and we find other people that we can get brought in to Braver Angels, work as a team, work with each other, do for the less, do for the people that are less than us, okay, and get the people to start looking at Christians and Braver Angels as people that love and not to get this bad rap because in the church we're fighting, okay? You said this about me. Well, go talk to him about it. Talk to God about it. Talk to the pastor about it. Get it fixed, okay? But forgive. I was ran over by a road rage man in 1999 on July the 8th. Had I been killed that day, I was going to hell. I couldn't change that. I was going to hell. And I, 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 I overcame it 20 years later after I had given my life to the Lord. Not everybody believes like I do. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I was run over on July 8th, 1999. Literally run over like a dog. Wow. I came back. God had grace on me. Thank you. And, mm. and I came back. And I came back. It took a long time. 20 years later, after I had given my life to the Lord, I'm sitting, I'm listening to my pastor preach. And he's talking about not everybody does things that realizes what they've done was a sin or even wrong. This guy apparently didn't feel any remorse of any kind. 
me catch your breath. At least I'm Thank crying. You. Thank you. <laughs> I went to that man's house 20 years later, almost to the day, and I found him. He remembered me. It turns out he used to work with my dad years ago. I had no idea that. Turns out he was a carpool person with a very dear, near friend of mine, his dad. I talked to him. I said, you remember me? He says, you're the guy I ran over. I said, yeah, that's me. I said, I come in peace. And I went up, sat on his deck with him and talked with him. And I said, um, I get the feeling you don't feel like you did anything to deserve to be forgiven. He said, well, he said, I just needed to get through there. It's a construction job. I felt I need to get through there. He said, I didn't feel like I did anything wrong. I said, let me tell you this then. I do forgive you, whether you feel like you need to be forgiven or not, but I do forgive you. And I said, furthermore, I want to apologize for that day. You may not feel like that I owe you an apology, but I'm going to apologize to you for whatever I must have done or somebody had must have done to cause you to do what you did. I said, you're forgiven, and I want you to accept my apology. Wow, that's a and powerful he did. story. Then he says, and I'll close with a happy note. Then he says, well, that's really great. He said, and he's an old man. He's 83. Pardon you all that's 83, but I, he was 63 when he did this, and I was 60, and I'm 63 now. So he says, I'm in a uh, senior bo volleyball league. You want to come and join us? <laughs> I can barely oh, walk, much less play volleyball. But uh, I said, no, but I'll come and watch you sometime. Great. So it ended well. But Thank you. Let's work together, parallel Indeed. this together, and let's go back and let's go do something for okay. some people. One more okay. question. Yeah, one more, one more question. Let's see. Um, man, I'm going to create a lot of enemies. Uh, okay, let's see. This guy right here. Yes, you right there. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you to... To run so far. All right. Hello. My name is Marshall Arisa. I'm from Akron, Ohio. And I would identify myself as a Protestant, fundamentalist, evangelical. At least that's where I go to church. But I would consider myself just a basic garden variety Christian. I just want to thank you folks for tearing up this topic about faith communities and building bridges. But as we've heard from a number of different people here, the words of Jesus come back to me, and it's like, physician, heal yourself. How can we reach out to the non-believing faith community when we can't even talk within our own circle? And, you know, the heart of Christianity is just really two things. It's a relationship, relationship with God, relationship with each other, and reconciliation. Bringing us back together again, back together with God, back together with each other. So if that's the key message in all of our different branches of Christianity, whether you're Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, or Protestant or Oriental Orthodox Coptic, why can't we agree upon that? Why can't we come together? Well, I think here's an issue. Theologically, we have our differences, but how important are those theological differences? And does that prevent us from coming together and having that Brave discussion, is that the most important thing? Yeah. Does that really, is that the most important thing? Can't we get past that and have that discussion amongst the, the church, the full community, the full church of Christ, and come together? Because the non-believing world looks at the church and says, you're divided, you can't even agree upon yourself, so why should I listen to you? I'm, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the lack of Christian unity. I'm going to give a totally shameless plug for my book that just came out in May. It's called Agents of Grace, How to Bridge Divides and Love as Jesus Loves. And it's about Christians and uh, why we're fighting and how we can find unity. Um, sorry about that, but I couldn't resist. But that's a really good word. Well, and I will uh, plug mine as well, which there may <laughs> still be some copies in the bookstore beyond um, oh, seeing the unseen beyond prejudices, paradigms, and party lines, and a, a blurb is uh, of endorsements uh, given by David Blankenhorn. Uh, thank you all for coming. Can we stand? And I'll offer a prayer. May God give us the grace to never sell ourselves short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous now for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. 
May God take our minds and think through them. May God take our lips and speak through them. May God take our hearts and set them on fire. In your name we pray. Amen.